And this is where the ecclesiastical deed as a deed comes into effect. Now the ecclesiastical deed has gone through a number of changes since it's been first promulgated and shown as a remedy. And we're about to undertake a number of changes. And I want to go through those now in the time allocated. And then we'll finish off with this issue of complexity. But with the ecclesiastical deed, the first is when we started the ecclesiastical deed and those that were courageous enough and willing enough to present has had a huge impact because it is stated for all on earth and all in heaven our intent to no longer live as slaves. And indeed, the first ecclesiastical deeds were sealed in blood, as I know many of you know. I mean, it was a painful process. And what they did, it also signalled the end of the age of blood and blood covenant, which is still part of their claim structure. They are still claiming their authority based on a blood covenant that they repudiated 70 years ago and showed utter dishonour and disgrace to with your ecclesiastical deeds. They have destroyed their right because those that issued ecclesiastical deeds in blood and those deeds, those documents are more valuable than papal bulls and they have been dishonoured. They have dishonoured their own system at its heart. Now it's time to refine what we're doing. The ecclesiastical deed has been issued until now as a notice. That is, a deed has been used as a form of notice. Well, there was a reason for that. And we've explained that. What we do, we do for ourselves and we do for history. And part of what we have needed to do, and, and I appreciate every single man and woman that has helped in this process, because it is much your process and the process for the future in historically ending their system. Now, whilst they don't care at the moment or appear not to care, history will be our judge and show that they ended the age of Mithra, the age of blood sacrifice, by dishonouring and disgracing instruments that honoured the very letter of the law in Leviticus, of atonement and blood atonement. They dishonoured the own principles of their law through ignorance, stupidity, arrogance and heresy. Now with deeds and the ecclesiastical deed, it is time to use the deed for what it is, a deed first, and its effect as a notice second. What does this mean? Well, just as we want to record a will and testament with the clerk or county recorder, just as they do now, but doing it as we are alive, we will re be recording our ecclesiastical deed as a deed with the county recorder. And if the county recorder or if we don't have a county, our council recorder, if we don't have a council, our town clerk, if we don't have a town clerk, then whatever the central administration is for this, if they do not honour our deed, if they do not record our deed, then the dishonour deed will then go to the next highest clerical administration in the Roman system, which for most will be the land office, the land titles office. Why? Because under the Roman system, we're considered land. We're considered a creature of the land. So there are a number of changes in that process there with ecclesiastical deed. And the things that people will, will immediately come to to ask, I, I'm sure, well, 
say, you know, I went through an ecclesiastical deed process. Does this mean what I've done in the past is wrong? No. That's why I've spent this time talking very carefully about the importance of what's being done. Nothing that has been done ever with the ecclesiastical deed is wrong. Nothing in the instructions and the material we've done has been wrong with the ecclesiastical deed. But it is a living thing. The deed is a demonstration to the Roman system that in certain circumstances you evoke your divine right, you evoke the fact that you are a divine being in front of them. And so far they have dishonoured the very essence of their system, which is all property ultimately is owned by the divine. A deed is an ecclesiastical instrument for the conveyance of property. All officers obtain their authority through the divine and divine succession. They've disgraced themselves and continue to disgrace themselves on this over and over. So no, nothing you've done with your ecclesiastical deed is invalidated. What we're doing is as we continue to unearth and uncover this system, we will not simply do things for the sake of doing them uh, at risk of being accused that things constantly change. The ecclesiastical deed is being refined and is becoming what it ultimately is, a deed. A deed to demonstrate your living intent as a living divine being. So the ecclesiastical deed becomes the proof of, of, of what people would probably try and consider what they would call a living will, which is an oxymoron, but more appropriately a living testament. And your will and testament is the rebuttal of their claim of intestate and proof of your position as general executor over the estate. So they're the changes that are coming uh, into documents. And I ask for your patience, but it's why we've brought it down to the court site. Now, I mentioned, before we talk about complexity, I mentioned this point of the public record and the public notice. It has been a very frustrating thing for all of you, I realise, that you submit valid documents into their system and they appear to reject them. We have, and we have had there for some time, a superior system that has awaited this material and this preparation to be turned on. When you're faced with a controversy in the Roman system, it will be a requirement that you go to the court site and you register that the controversy exists. When you register that the controversy exists, depending on the nature of the controversy, there may or may not be some standard templates provided to you ready to start filling out. As you then have documents to be recorded, you will be able to enter in the nature of the documents and obtain a unique record number. That record number is the same concept as your trust number. It is a unique 18-digit alphanumeric number. That number then is recorded on the document that needs to be a PDF before it is then uploaded into the register. And when it is uploaded, depending on the nature of it, it is, will be searchable across all the court sites and indeed all the Eucadia sites as a permanent public record or public notice if it is also to be gazetted and perfected and witnessed. Now this system uh, and the instruction of this will be updated. It's very exciting. It will be extremely strong. And indeed, what we will be doing when any court case is brought forward is providing our own docket and providing our own historical reference to the material that we provided. So that if there is any dispute, we can refer them to 
the notarial procedure and the public record and any public notice associated with the matter should it get down to debating an argument. I have a lot, lot more to say on this in the coming weeks as it's turned on. Well, in the few minutes left, let me switch gears and just talk about this question of complexity. And I've covered a lot tonight, and I hope what I've covered tonight has answered some questions, answered some concerns, and explained some of the things we're doing. But I want to come back to this question, because if we discussed even the, the fraction of things tonight, the concern is this question of complexity. There's a huge amount to read on UKDA in one heaven. It's fine to say go and read positive law, but in positive law there are hundreds of articles and there are thousands of canons. And that's before the 22 books are even completed. So with that I know it's easy for people to say, if they haven't already said, Eucadia is making it more complex than it needs to be or that it is overly complex. Now when you hear this, indeed, when you may feel this yourself, I ask you to consider the following. If you lived in a community of 10 people, those 10 people were willing to live and were self-disciplined enough to live under the golden rule, love one another, do unto one another as I do to you, then you wouldn't need any of these laws, any of these codes, any of these policies. But if you lived in a community of even 300 where you wish to have a school or you wish to have a health care, or you wish to trade, then none of those activities could take place unless there was some form of agreed and simple rules. Now, no longer can you just live by the golden rule, but you need to qualify that. And some may say, well, that's already covered. And what you're talking about was already thought through and is reflected in the Bible. Indeed, the Bible contains 613 laws in the Old Testament and a number of those are very clear and a number of them unfortunately contradict the very words of Jesus in the New Testament which creates a problem because if one is to claim to be a Christian, then one must place the words of Jesus above all other words. Otherwise, you can't be technically a, a Christian. If you don't believe the words of Jesus Christ above other words, then you can't, by definition, call yourself a Christian. So the fact that Leviticus has certain rules that directly and openly contradict the words of Jesus Christ means that if you use that system, you're not a Christian, you're a Biblian. So we can't use that system as a reference. The point being that even in a community of 300, just 300, we start to get into the complexities of life. Okay, we're going to trade. How do we trade? What's our money system? We're going to run a school. What's our curriculum? Do people dress? Don't they dress? Do we teach them any history? What's that history? Who chooses to decide that history? Before you know it, you're dealing with a system of law. Now, admittedly, that system of law, and you may take the Amish as an example, that system of law may be a lot, lot simpler than what you see on Eucadia. But now let's take it to a larger community. Now let's take it to a community of just 2 million, just 2 million out of the 7, 7.5 billion people of the world, a drop in the ocean. Now we're no longer dealing with simply questions of how people...